Why should we treat this topic? Questions asked by teenagers regarding science. Well, because there is an urgent need. You may be aware that recently, internationally, in Europe, in the US, polls were made that show that people are partly losing their faith because of science. This is a uh, Discovery Institute um, survey analysis that was published in 2013. And it says, let me just read the summary, young people leave their faith for a variety of reasons, but for a significant number of them, beliefs about science play an important role. Not the only role, but an important role, and for, for some it's decisive. This young man, I understand, committed suicide when he didn't come to terms with his faith in the context of science. This is, of course, a striking and rare example, but many people uh, leave churches when they go to college. Two or three years ago, I was in Virginia, partly to do apologetic talks, partly research talks. Virginia is, compared to where I live, a very Christian society, community. But young people, I understand, are leaving churches in droves, partly when they enter college, so they haven't been prepared well enough. There's a book called You Lost Me, Why Young Christians Are Leaving Church and Rethinking Faith. It was published in 2011. On the back of the book, it says, is the church losing the next generation? Millions of young Christians are disconnecting from church as they transition into adulthood. They are real people, not just statistics. And number one reason quoted on the uh, dust cover of the book says, quotes person, some Mike, I knew from church that I couldn't believe in both science and God, so that was it. I didn't believe in God anymore. Wrong church teaching, if I may say so, uh, quite bluntly. Just a reminder for me, a nephew of mine, when he was in 11th form, said that in biology classes in, in Germany, they were shown a video and the teacher treated the subject of evolution very uh, ideologically, I might say, and they were shown a video which included um, videos which they had taken from creationists, Christians that believe in, in creation of, of any sort. And my nephew told me, this is Eastern Germany, city of Halle, one hour south of Berlin. My nephew told me that he thinks that he's the only one that still believes in God, still believes in, God in, in a class of approximately 30 school children, which is fairly normal in our setting, sadly. But this helped. Science helped to uh, confirm their people's doubts that there is a God. So it's a crucial topic, I think, for keeping youth within the Christian fellowship or not. And the several polls, like I've indicated, show that young people lose faith in school, college and university because of science or a misunderstanding of the relation of science and Christian faith articles. And you have to also mind the degree gap, if I may put it like this, in some cultural context between the present and previous generations in, in churches. In what used to be the GDR, many Christians were not allowed university entrance. So now the generation in their 20s, the first generation from Christian homes, where well, lots of them have now entered university. And I understand that in some relatively conservative Christian circles, for example, in the United States, the same is true for different reasons. So mind this gap of scientific understanding of how people view science in the generation, my generation and the generation after. Take also note of the fun aspect of science, as exemplified by lots of successful science programs in TV, blogs, YouTube, like uh, John Lennox when he was interviewed yesterday uh, for the scientists' academic and apologetics network said that when he was approximately 19 years of age, he thought that the Bible was really boring compared to mathematics, which was his field. And I can understand that. I can understand that. And you can understand why thermodynamics has been very, it has been very fascinating for you, I trust. So this is uh, not an argument. It just feels better to look at science than to look into the Bible. And adjust to the fact 
uh, which is, I think, very obvious for everybody that the ultimate reliable answers in our culture are expected to be given by science or scientists. Certainly in the setting where I live, the most secular area of the world, former GDR and Czech Republic. 10 to 15 percent of the population are affiliated in some way, maybe very loosely, to any church or faith, never mind Christian or any other faith. So how to not answer? I've, this is not an English word, I think. You can put it in your dictionary after my talk. <laughs> how to proact, how to be proactive, not wait until the problem actually has become a burning problem or the answers uh, just answer, but react proactively. Find somebody or a team in your church that regularly engages with people, young people on science especially if you're a scientist. Show them the beautiful science you are doing. Explain that to them. Look at stuff with them and share your fascination with science if you happen to be a science teacher or a scientist so that they can notice in your person, which is a strong, strong witness, that you love to, to do science and they will also see you in church Sundays, see you engaging in Bible classes or whatever your ministry or your participation in your church happens to be. Secondly, motivate, if you're, not, if you're not a scientist, not a scientifically minded person, just don't have the time for it, motivate sign teachers or scientists or other interested persons in your church or neighboring churches, in your surroundings to regularly write or tell about something fascinating science has found and use it to praise the creator. Engage people in science as a question. Engage scientifically minded young people with Christian scientists. Some are really, really bright and they want to do something with their brain. They can't do Bible studies all the time. We, everybody must do Bible study. That's where we find Jesus, where we find the answers God wants to give. But some people, they, 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 their brain runs dry if they don't get something uh, to work on uh, with their brain. Subscribe a Christian website in your church or family this is also, of course, applicable to families. Subscribe a Christian website or journal that deals with matters of science. And that is what I mean by proactively engaging with the topic, not just answering difficult questions. And hopefully we'll get rid of all this scientific stuff as soon as possible. This is just a picture that shows me teaming up with a religious instruction religious education teacher. We have religious education classes in normal state schools in Germany. We have a slightly different system from, uh, from the US system, for example. Uh, you can see me here uh, engaging with uh, 11th formers or 10th formers. I can't remember exactly. A religious education teacher a while ago asked me, could, you, could, we, could I take my class to your university, to your seminar room? show them your research labs and afterwards they want to talk to you why you believe in God. And I've done that several times. Anyway, the, the uh, students, the pupils, whatever you call them, the young people, teenagers, they were very keen on discussing with me, much more than my students. So that's another thing. On, uh, engage, they want to engage on spiritual, in spiritual discussions. That is actually good fun. But also not that easy. But then teaming up with a religious education teacher is, of course, I think a very good team. His wife is a, has a PhD in physics, so I told him, why don't you do that with your wife? He said she doesn't have a missionary heart. That is not to say that she's a bad Christian, she's just different. And that is probably also something which you need to nourish or pray for or develop if you want to do something like this. So, teenagers, that's the crucial age. If you lose them then, you'll lose them for a very long time, or perhaps forever, and let's pray that that doesn't happen. Whereas students in the European meaning of the, uh, of meaning of the word, people in their 20s, they're usually not that interested in, in the spiritual things. I find, and atheist students have told me themselves, that it's hard to find a student at that age who's not interested only in how do I spend the weekend, when can I meet my boyfriend again or girlfriend, and how do I pass the examination as quickly as possible. 
deep spiritual matters, teenagers are the persons to address. And I feel that we underestimate uh, their capacity of taking in complicated scientific stuff, not all of them, of course, and complicated spiritual matters. Give them a lot to chew on. I find that that really helps. So this was the proactive side. <laughs> but very often we need to answer, and that's going to be the main, to main part of, of my workshop. Three steps. When you begin to answer a question about science, you answer it with science, first of all. You don't quote a Bible verse. If somebody t shows you, look, uh, the cosmologists say that the universe has an age of f 14 billion years. You don't open your Bible, first of all, if the question is exactly on, 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 for example, this. But you ask him, can we take some time to look at the evidence for this? Why do they say 14 point something billion years? Where does the number come from? So try to answer the quest a scientific question with science. This is not to in any way say anything disrespectful about the Bible, but the question was, what about the science? The answer has to do, has got to do with the science. Otherwise, the, uh, the young person will quite rightly, perhaps, conclude that you don't know. <laughs> if you don't know, as I said before, try to find a team, make a team, a science answering proactive team. Answer with the science involved. Don't jump to, to other topics. The question about the age of the universe, for example, has got nothing to do with biology in the first place. So you don't have to talk about evolution in that context. Meaning, again, that you have to be somewhat clear in your own mind on what belongs where, which question belongs where. After the initial answer, which could take a long time or a short time, of course, it also needs our spiritual um, feeling on how important is this question and answer for the person that is asking. Is it very important or does he just want to have an answer so he can get rid of this, this stuff? Then you want to unfold this. I think you also, and many of you are younger than me anyway, but all of us, I think, know that we like to be presented a number of possibilities with pros and cons attached to them before we believe anything, which makes sense intellectually. Scientifically speaking, this makes a lot of sense, of course. But I think you should also do that when you answer a scientific question in a church or theological Christian context. Discuss different answers different people give. Show the pros and cons, what they fail to explain, and then go on to show the worldview background and context. Context, finally, you may want to, again, depending on how important the question is, how difficult, how big the answer has to be, if it's going to be a comprehensive answer, context the question and the answer the young person probably already has been given by somebody else. Usually when the question is asked, probably some answer has been given, which this young person or yourself or all of us grapple with to contextualize with the Bible. But the answer the person has been given has been contextualized usually with naturalism. We'll see that uh, in, with concrete examples in a few minutes' time. So this is something which, of course, takes more than science. We are moving into the realm of philosophy, you might say. Ethics explain the devastating effect of naturalism on human ethics, on human thinking, I should also add, on human thinking. Naturalism is such a narrowing, has such a narrowing effect on human thinking. For that, looking at Roderich, a philosopher, of course, if you want to unfold this uh, thoroughly, it might take a book to do that. <laughs> But that is usually not what you can do. You can't always give a book to a person with one question. So that is why what we want to do next is try to find ways of answering relatively quickly and then find out if the person wants to know more. So that was meant as a kind of introduction. The topic is really important because many young people are losing faith 
because of a misunderstanding of science or because science is underrated or misrepresented in churches. Basically, I think what we want to do is present science positively in the first place. This is proactive and it's easy. It's actually easy. We don't have to twist our, our spiritual uh, understanding at all. Science is a God-given enterprise and ability <coughs> of humans to study his creation. It's actually a fallen creation with fallen scientists, but that is another matter. Science is a means to praise God through science and to develop our creativity. I mean, the kind of things engineers have come up with, amazing creativity. Where does that come from? Not by chance. Plus, science, well, if you, if you say anything bad about science, I may be tempted to ask, but why do you use the modern acquisitions, the modern developments of medicine? That is a scientific development. So you're not being consistent. If on one hand you say science is bad, on the other hand you're happy when there is some medical <coughs> instrumentation that saves your life or alleviates it. So science alleviates our life in this ruined masterpiece which we still call creation. To sum all this up, we should have a positive attitude towards science. Positive attitude towards science. One of the important things when I do apologetic talks for non-Christians on science and faith matters, one of the very important things which I have to try to bring across is that I'm fascinated by science. I like to do it. Because if people feel like he just wants to say something negative about science, I may just as well stop talking. Balance it by biblical teaching, of course. We want to contextualize science, scientific findings, scientific endeavors. The questions which I want to address are, of course, a selection. Of course, a selection. A selection from real-life questions that were collected over a number of years in a large Christian school, but it's not only Christians that attend this school. School meaning the, the questions are from, from uh, young people the age of something like 14 to 19 years of age. 14 to 19, approximately. The questions were collected in different settings which the school created, so to speak, uh, and they were treated in the school. But uh, anyway, I asked the school headmaster, they have several hundred uh, pupils per year, I asked him to, to send me his selection of questions. And I've selected from this selection a bit and group the questions. I've grouped the questions into four categories. This is category one. Category one, typical questions that young people ask. And it's the, uh, the basic question you get, are faith and science compatible? The word and between faith and science, I've been told, is annoying or irritating to some more naturalistically minded people. They don't like the end between it. It's or, I understand some people say. So this sentence in itself also already contains some philosophical aspect. And this is some questions which the teenagers and the school did not categorize like I did. But I think these four relatively representative questions they all fall under the category of are faith and science compatible? I'll just read out the questions which I've selected. Can some wonders be explained scientifically? Does science, mathematics have anything to do with God? Please comment on Hawking's opinion that the universe came into existence without God. What about proofs of God's <coughs> existence? Are they still valid? It's just like I find typical questions fairly different among themselves, which I would group under our faith in science compatible. Heading B in the outline, which is as available as a PDF on, on the app. The um, B point, point B is something like a summary answer by me, how to contextualize the questions and how we could approach trying to answer them. So let's try. 
Let's just try it. Can some wonders be explained scientifically? Well, a thorough uh, answer to that would, of course, um, mean that you have to define wonder and science and how does science work. That might be advisable if the person you're talking to has a, a large interest in this, in wonders and in what does science actually do. But the way I have personally encountered this question in talks and schools is usually that it's probably sufficient to point out that yes, we could do that, but we would have to be on site to explain it. We would have to have been on site to see, in all due respect, what happened to the dead body of Jesus when he became alive again, like blood pressure or something, but we weren't there. But the way you, I'm now addressing you as if you had asked the question and you were a naturalist, the way you answer the question, uh, you ask the question, I think you want to have a, an explanation which explains the supernatural aspect of the thing away. You don't want it to be something somebody wanted to happen. Let's take as another example the crossing of the Red Sea, where it says in the Bible, doesn't it, a strong wind came which sort of um, shoved the waters to each side so the people of Israel could cross without becoming wet. So yes, there was a wind. And even the flood, uh, the great flood in, in Genesis flood, that was water, basically. The people were not drowned, sadly, in something supernatural. They were drowned in water, water like we find today. So what you really want to do is, with this question, explain away that there was some purpose behind it. Somebody was doing it for a purpose. Something was happening, like in the resurrection of Jesus, which you and I have never experienced. I've touched somebody that was dying. I would rather touch somebody that is coming alive after he was dead. Unfortunately, this is not what we've been granted at the moment. So this is how I would try to answer this question scientifically. If that means there is no purpose, you cannot decide that with science. If there is a purpose, the science can only analyze the material workings that accompany what's happening. I wonder if an observer from space, when he saw the flood on the Earth, and he would not know what was happening, would have guessed that God was sadly judging this world through the flood. I don't th think you could have seen that from let's say Mars or some other um, convenient vantage point. Does science or mathematics have anything to do with God? In that case, again, there is something which ultimately you'd, you'd want to drive at explaining God. What's your concept of God? You would want to make the person that asked this question try to understand his understanding of God and try to perhaps um, give him a better understanding if necessary. Because, yes, of course, science and mathematics have a lot to do with God. He created things and interrelations of things and numbers and everything, so we can study that. But God is not sort of like in the science or in the mathematics. This is probably a misconception of God behind this. Number three, please comment on Hawking's opinion that the universe came into existence without God. Well, first of all, it's Hawking's opinion. I'm of a different opinion. Sometimes it's really sufficient if people know you and, well, I mean, if you're a trusted person in your church for different reasons, and you just tell them, look, this is a complicated mathematical stuff. If you like, we can try to understand it together but basically, he's wrong. He's wrong. He doesn't like the concept of God. So um, that's my comment. <laughs> this could be absolutely sufficient. Because you know, in science, as you probably know, a lot is done by authority, not by arguing. Because I'm a complete layman when it comes to mathematics. Ilona, if you forgive me, 
saying so she's a mathematician I think she's a complete layman when it comes to chemistry is that true yeah it's true so scientists can not say anything that is more meaningful than you can do on any topic we can't because we don't know enough in this uh, in this um, with this um, question of course you could also argue that Hawkins says something like because there is a law of gravity the universe came into existence out of nothing so what's the understanding of nothing if there was a law of gravity that's not my nothing my nothing is absolutely nothing nothing not even a law but I think that's difficult for people to understand because a law is something immaterial maybe it was there although it wasn't there you have to also think about the imagination what do people imagine when they see these worlds so in this case I think the simplest thing is to just say um, I'm of a different opinion and so are many eminent mathematics mathematicians and cosmologists and if that is not enough we'll have to spend a lot of time let me just try to give a quick beginnings of an answer for this one and then I would like to to ask for your comments on this first slide of course I hope you didn't come here to and expect me to answer all the questions that would be lots of talks actually but we cannot always do lots of talks we have to kind of adjust to the person that is asking and try to give something that will help him go the next step or leave the question uh, alone what about proofs of God's existence are they still valid yes because God exists there will be ways of finding that he exists you will perhaps feel it or there are historical things that prove the existence of God but it's not a proof like you can prove that this is I'm, I'm here and I'm talking this is not the kind of proof proofs of God's existence are uh, logical deductions you have to use a lot of logic you have to look at okay what are the premises what are people's first ideas which they use to argue well we can explain this only if there's a God behind it or something and this are they still valid well I can get come back to that later this is unfortunately something which is really really dif difficult to er eradicate in our culture that something that is old is probably no longer, no longer true and that of course is a big problem the Bible is old the Bible is old and God well he is even older <laughs> if that is a proper word probably not to describe it let me go on give you an idea of the next big and complicated field perhaps we get a feeling of how we could go about all this what about the contrast between biblical reports and scientific findings how come science tells a completely different story about origins than the Bible does and you see this list is longer I did that on purpose because there are more questions and that is of course because it's a Christian school with many pupils from Christian homes they would be asking questions like why, the, why does the Bible say that the Sun turns around the earth evolution creation or both how do creation and science go together and so on so this is a longer list for two reasons one the school children knew about the Bible from their churches and homes this kind of question would never come up in a secular school like in the area where I live people don't have these problems and that is also something when you talk to teenagers don't assume that teenagers from a secular home have the same questions that your children might have because they don't even have the vocabulary to answer this kind of question I find so their questions will be diff at least differently worded but if we take these questions a lot of it is about creation evolution this will be I think we will not stop to have to discuss this it's a very very central thing the evolution creation debate is a very central debate and we cannot get away from it as much as we would like to and we will not find the solution I trust in our lifetime we will just not find the one solution which you can give as a five-minute answer and everything will be clear-cut 
Whichever answer you give, first answer to this, whichever answer you give, there will be a residue of unexplained, even seemingly contradictory facts, either in the Bible or in findings in nature. So we'll not find an answer that will cover everything. See, this explains this and that and that, and no residue, unexplained residue left. Why is that? Well, the Bible doesn't say a lot about creation. Three pages or something, maybe four, plus the odd verse here and there. It's not a lot of information. You get more information on the, uh, on the um, generations of, of Israel families than on creation. That's just God <laughs> decided to do so. And secondly, scientific findings about the past are scarce and extrapolations. Like a biologist, who is not a Christian in one book, wrote, um, evolution is a hypothetical reconstruction of the past. It's a hypothetical reconstruction of the past. You don't see it happening. You have to reconstruct. This is one of the small questions which uh, troubled me when I was younger. Why does the Bible say that the sun turns around the earth? Um, because it says somewhere in, in the book of Joshua that the sun was stopped, which is mechanically speaking, if you imagine the just our solar system, something um, you cannot imagine how this could happen without the whole system breaking down, never to recover. This, of course, is an easy one. It's relative. It's absolutely relative. It depends on where you are. The Bible says that the sun turns around the earth because that is how you see it happening. It's the position of somebody on the earth that sees it. It's not a description of the solar system uh, in any um, Kepler or Copernicus way. Evolution, creation of both, that will take a long time. And first of all, perhaps it will help to define terms. If people tell me, you don't believe in evolution, do you? I would say, do I have to believe in that? I think it's observable. You observe that organisms change. That's a fact. Why do I have to believe in that? And then the conversation would go on like, but I was talking about millions of years and species and everything. I would say, indeed, I, have, I, will. I would have to believe in that. I can't see it. It's a certain theory which I believe doesn't have a lot to it, but it's general, generally accepted. And here you have to really decide which way you go personally. You have to come to terms with that, first of all, for yourself. Which one do I think more plausible? Evolution, with all the problem that generates for our, for our understanding of death and salvation of the earth, of myself, of humankind, or do I rather take the presently harder way of saying, no, there is some mistake, there was no evolution, God created, although probably in, in steps, perhaps with gaps, time gaps in between, and you, have to, you just have to decide. Is it possible that the theory of evolution is true but was made by God? This is a typical question where the person that, answer, that asked the question doesn't understand a lot. Because God did not create the theory of evolution, if at all, which I don't believe, he created macroevolution. This is, you'd have to talk to this person for a while so that he understands there is evolution and there is a theory of evolution which is proposed in biology and certain reasons for some people to believe that this is how life came about and developed on Earth. The cosmological ones, did God start the Big Bang, I find a bit easier because the Bible just says in the beginning God created the earth and the heavens. So usually this is always the quick answer, you know, not the fully scientific answer. So whenever that was, I have no idea, maybe 15 million years ago. I, I have no problem with that. that. But did God start the Big Bang? I don't know whether I would call the Big Bang. God started this creation where we live in. I would like, if this is a Christian answering, asking, I would like to understand for him that we believe that the universe was created, had a beginning. And I would, which is always works nicely, I would also point out that 
this Big Bang is actually a, a word Fred Hoyle invented to ridicule the whole concept. Even in the 1980s, I don't know about the present situation, people um, argued against anything like the Big Bang, materialists, because they didn't accept the beginning. And even nowadays, these fluctuations around the beginning, everything, that is um, naturalists trying to get rid of a beginning. They don't want a beginning because if there's a beginning and nothing before that, this very much suggests that somebody started it all. Did God start the evolution of species that, again, come to terms how you understand evolution in the context of the Bible? And one thing is really important. If you go with theistic evolution, you want to make clear that God is behind it all. You don't want to convince people of evolution. That You don't have to take care of that. <laughs> Other people do that already. What you want to do as a Christian that is convinced that there was biological evolution, and I'm not criticizing that, you want to make clear, and you have to think about it, how do I make it clear that this process could never have happened without God? And I think you can, because evolution is really clever. Just listen to how atheists write about evolution. Evolution invented, was very thoughtful, made up its mind, decided to, and then the organism decided it needed wings and it developed wings. If you look at the vocabulary, it's full of theistic or certainly teleological words, quite clearly. And I think you can show that easily. Right, we don't have the time to go through all the questions, unfortunately. Would anybody like to comment on this really important topic? You know, we are here, aren't we? Because we want to confirm for ourselves, encourage ourselves, that the Bible is God's infallible, eternal word. God's eternal word. So this range of questions, how do I fit a biblical, what the Bible has to say about certain things, how do, do I fit that together with what science says? It's really important. We cannot just stay like C.S. Lewis did on the philosophical plane. That's fine, and it goes very far for what it does. You also have to somehow uh, go into the biblical and, for that matter, scientific details. Don't you think? And that's the hard work. Much harder. People, I, I noticed that people in discussions like to move into something which I would call a generalization. Philosophical generalization ha has a lot of for it, but you have to come back to the details. Science is about details, and the Bible also very often is. Lots of people shy away from the details because it can get very controversial and difficult, and a lot of detail is involved, but that is what we would have to do here. Just two questions teenagers asked. How did Jesus talk to more than 1,000 people without a microphone? Why do so many Christians entertain medieval, completely outdated thinking? Yes. Well, for this, it really helps if the Bible teacher, your pastor or whoever does the Bible teaching in your church, especially for classes of teenagers, shows the fascination of history and archaeology and the fascination with what people were able to do in past times. We have to somehow overcome what C.S. Lewis called the cultural chauvinism, thinking like we are on top. Today, uh, a simple person, if you forgive me putting it like this, <coughs> a simple person, just because he lives in our time and culture, will think that he knows much better about everything than Abraham or Jesus or Martin Luther or any, anybody in the dark past. And that means you have to make sure that people understand that. Technology is one cultural acquisition and a, a nice one for that matter, but it doesn't answer questions like these. This is presupposing, obviously, that medieval was like stupid. And people don't know that, for example, 
an, a person that studies medieval sciences, a former colleague of mine told me that people in the Middle Ages were absolutely fascinated, the people that could write and publish, fascinated by human, uh, the human um, ratio, much more than later. So the scholastic uh, schools in Christianity, Thomas of Aquinas, they were thinkers, much more than we are. So what does medieval thinking mean? Probably that people were more intelligent when they thought about things than we do, more strict, more logical, certainly than me. Category number four, what about things in nature the Bible does not speak about? Doesn't this refute the Bible? <laughs> Questions? Explain the existence of dinosaurs from a biblical perspective. Another question, why is there no mathematics in the Bible? How oh, anybody could ask that, I don't know. Explain the existence of dinosaurs. I remember a friend of mine, Reinhard Juncker, some of you know him, spoke in my university on evolution, and he's uh, very good at showing the um, many, many flaws the biological theory of macroevolution has. And um, afterwards, I said to him, look, you've answered very, very cleverly, but the questions were less clever than your answers. What you did was, you took a question, thought about it, he's very quick at that, transformed it into the correct question <laughs> that should have been asked, and then answered that question. And people didn't follow that thought process of yours in several instances. So for some people, the simple fact that dinosaurs, dinosaur fossils were found, but they're not mentioned in the Bible, means the Bible is faulty. Quite obviously. It doesn't talk about dinosaurs. Big, big things, you know. Everybody is fascinated by them. Boys in their teens, I mean, they're more interested in dinosaurs than in justification by faith. Probably. Probably. <laughs> not all of them. So what do you do? Well, you can, for example, explain there are lots of things not mentioned in the Bible. You get a selection of what God chose to talk about. There are no tigers in the Bible. I miss the tigers more than the dinosaurs. Lots of things are not. China is not in the Bible. Lots of things are not in the Bible. So what you would like to try is show to such a person, and this is actually a good question, Try to talk to him about, so what do you find in the Bible? Why do I actually find it in the Bible? What's so, what's, it's so interesting about these books of the Bible that God decided to, to turn them into the book he gave us. And the same actually applies to mathematics, although for mathematics you could probably show that there is mathematics in the Bible, although the Euclidean formula, even though they have been known since more than 2,000 years, are, are not included. What about things the Bible talks about? Sorry. But there is no scientific evidence for them. What about angels, life after death, heaven? So here, of course, we have to walk into, into the reliability of the Bible. And I find it very helpful in this context to have real life stories with a supernatural content where I know the person that experienced this supernatural thing. So if you use supernatural stories with young people, I don't think you surprise them that much anymore in our culture. The question is rather if they take the bait and go in the wrong direction if it will interest them in the supernatural, but in a way like um, Sister Reitzema just su suggested that they are something like fascinated and terrified. Presently, I don't see a better way of showing people that supernatural is real. And of course they will be frightened. I am actually sort of frightened. So. If you use such a story, the only way I know, but I have little experience in using these stories, the only way out that I know is that you witness that you're not afraid because you are sure there is somebody which is also supernatural but stronger. That's the only way I, I see around this. But in this secular um, atmosphere where I usually live, I find that I... I want to share some of these things. I haven't experienced anything I would want to share myself. 
So I have to draw on other people's stories, which I want to have firsthand, just to show that there is indeed more, something beyond what science can normally investigate. We had a dis debate a few years ago, two or three years ago. I engaged in a kind of debate with Rick Peels. He is a, he is a philosopher, the Freie Universität Amsterdam. He works with René van Woudenberg, who was in the um, Scientist Network last year, a Christian philosopher, University of Amsterdam. And we talked about the limits of science. And of course there are limits. It's relatively easy to convince a scientist that there are limits to his method. Of course, we are all aware that our scientific methods have limits. You need to convince us that there is something beyond the limits. <laughs> That's more important, sort of. And of course, we'll all accept there's something beyond the limits which we have not yet discovered. But to say that there is something which is completely different from what any science can discover, and it's absolutely real, for that you need something like supernatural things, and if that is a little bit too big and scary, you could use qualia terms, terms that have a lot of subjective aspects to it. I personally presently use the concept of pain a lot. There's an FOCL talk of mine which was recorded last year on, on the web on pain, which I used to show that there is something absolutely real. Nobody can deny there is pain, but you cannot describe it fully uh, with scientific terms. You cannot break it down in a reductionist way. And there is also consciousness and values and a few other things which are actually served to us by atheists should perhaps say um, honest atheists like Thomas Nagel, New York philosopher in his book Mind and Cosmos, he enlists um, entities, let me just say entities in this world, which are absolutely, they exist, they are there, but you cannot explain or understand them on the pure, purely materialist, naturalist terms. So that would be the less scary way of even explaining to teenagers uh, why we believe in, in things <laughs> which are ultimately not things in that way. But the kind of argument or reasoning that Thomas Nagel, for example, uses um, is quite nice for a philosophically minded teenager. But for the average teenager, I would think it's a bit too complicated. It's less striking than angels' life after death in heaven. <laughs>